let's get started. Thank you guys for coming. So I'm going to be talking about APIs are for automata, PowerShell is for people. It's a very long-winded title. I'm starting to regret a little bit, but what it's basically about is if you're going to be building a PowerShell module, try to make it as user-friendly as you possibly can. My name is Stuart McLeod. You can get me on GitHub. I'm on Twitter and various other platforms. I don't really engage terribly much, but if you would like to get in touch, you can probably find me there, or you can find me on the conference Slack, or just come up and say hello and that kind of stuff. Uh, a big thanks to the sponsors. You've probably seen them out during the last couple of days. Please go and say hello. They've got lots of good swag. Without them, we wouldn't be here. So here's the plan. I'm going to do a little bit of introductions, tell a bit about myself, a bit about what we've kind of done, modules in general, and a little history of the module that I've been working on mostly for the last four or five years. Um, then the main bulk is going to be tips from the trenches. The main bulk of this is things that we did in module design that either worked really well or in most cases did not work well at all. And hopefully you can avoid those same pitfalls with a bit of live demo. So there's gonna be some codes. I'll get to the code as quickly as I can. Um, it may go well, it may not, but you never know. And then round it all up at the end and everyone goes home happy. Straightforward. So who am I and what do I do? So I'm a senior enterprise architect at Akamai Technologies. Um, I've been, uh, working on the PowerShell team since its inception in Akamai. It's a project that I kind of started off as a bit of a side hustle, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I've been doing PowerShell for about 14 years, ever since I started getting into IT in general. I am Scottish, not Irish. Some people seem to be making that mistake. Somebody thought I was Australian, which is bananas, but there we go. So in case you can't understand me, please do shout. I do occasionally say stuff and people look at me like I'm speaking Dutch. Um, who are Akamai Technologies and what do they do? So Akamai are the largest content delivery network in the world. You're probably using Akamai today. You probably use an Akamai service. You won't know. We're not particularly well known outside of the industry, but we do an enormous amount of web traffic. We do a lot of media streaming. We're now a big security platform. We do compute. We recently purchased Linode and we've integrated that into the platform. We have 350,000 servers in 2,000 locations. So when Abby was talking about the edge in the keynote yesterday, this is basically what we're talking about. Our servers are, for the most part, in your ISP. We don't use big super pops the way other uh, kind of IaaS providers do. So generally, when you're talking to an Akamai server, it's as close to you as we can get it. And that's what the edge is really referring to. So we and others do a similar kind of thing. Um, but yeah, as I say, we do CDN, security, compute, FAS, storage, a whole bunch of stuff. So why does Akamai need a PowerShell module? Well, we have 93 production APIs. I checked the list yesterday. Um, most customers aren't gonna use 93 APIs. Most customers will use five or 10 of them, but we've got multiple APIs which have different requirements. They have different styles. We have a fairly complex authentication model. Uh, it's a proprietary thing we call EdgeGrid, which is basically cryptographic signing. Um, it's not quite as straightforward as just sending an API token in an authorization header, so it requires a little bit of interaction. Um, Generally, with our APIs, you can get in, most of them, it's just one-to-one. -one. If you're dealing with a particular asset type, they use that API. Sometimes, you have to use more than one API to do different parts of a create, read, update, and delete cycle, which is a bit weird. You create something with API A, you read it and update it with API B, and then you delete it with API A again, which can be a little bamboozling. This is a result of a thing which I like to call inside-out development. Inside-out development, everybody does this. It's a term I invented for this talk. But it basically means that the structure of your public APIs are in part due to the structure of your organization. You know, you have 20 different APIs because you might have 20 different development teams. Now, if you're in a web world, the fact that you have microservices and you've got lots of different sort of uh, ways to interact with stuff is hidden from you, the user, by the website. The website binds this all together. You go to www.example.com. If it's got 20 microservices or 50 or 100, doesn't matter. That's hidden from view. But if you're using APIs, you have to know about all this stuff. You have to know about the different requirements. You have to know about the different styles and all the rest of it. So the idea behind our PowerShell module was one CLI to rule them all. We had a, a CLI previously. It got a little disjointed. It had different modules which required different things and they were done by different teams. We want to have one centralized thing where you could use the same approach to everything. So with 
invented that in my first shell module. It started off as a bit of a side project in 2019, basically something to make my life easier. It grew and grew and grew. It's written in native PowerShell, not in C Sharp. I'd like to say that there was some philosophical reason for that. The reason for that is I don't know how to write in C Sharp, so we wrote the whole thing in PowerShell. But that does mean that if you're looking at our code, you can see all of our code. If you're a PowerShell user, you can go to our, our GitHub, it's all open source, and you can look at the code and see exactly what we're doing, which I really quite like. I know that has efficiency issues, et cetera, which we'll talk about later, but everything is there. We released version 1.0 in 2020 with about 350 functions. The most recent release was 1.12 last year, which has 880 functions. That becomes relevant. Um, we're just about to release version two. Like I could, I almost released it yesterday. It got very close. But it'll hopefully be out this week or next week. And everything I'm gonna tell you came out of a project we started last January, so January of 2023, where we sat down and we looked at the module and said, what can we do better? If we were gonna plan this from scratch, which we didn't because it sort of grew organically, what would we do differently? And we came up with a whole bunch of design tenets and then we refactored the whole thing into what we're calling version two, which has most of the stuff, which is the bulk of what I'm about to tell you about. So these are things that we came up with and thought, well, that's better, let's do that, or let's not do this, et cetera, et cetera. It is used by more than 200 of our customers. It's overtaken our binary CLI in terms of usage. So it started off as a, an efficiency pro, uh, project so that I could work smarter. It's now heavily used and we're getting a bit of buy-in from execs, et cetera, et cetera. So it kind of grew naturally. No one on the team is a quote unquote developer. We're all architects and tech writers, et cetera. So it's kind of built itself up into being a viable product. So what did we learn? Many things of how to do things incorrectly. So let me flip over and we'll get into the code and I'll tell you about various things that we want to do. So let's duplicate, I don't know where that new slide has come from and we'll dive into VS Code. So tip number one, don't neglect PowerShell 5.1 or Windows PowerShell. There's so many subtle differences between PowerShell 5.1 and 7.4. Right, 7.4 is much better in many ways, as we all agree, and when you're running it on your laptops, you're all running seven something. You should probably be running 7.4, but your customers are not necessarily doing so. If you're pushing this to the gallery, if it's a public thing, always assume that someone is gonna be using 5.1, and it's probably because they have to. Stephen Booker was talking yesterday uh, in, in the, the morning session, server 2025 doesn't have PowerShell core or seven installed on it. It still comes with 5.1. So servers are your problem. You have to support 5.1 because someone is almost certainly running a Windows server machine somewhere or a laptop that they can't upgrade because of group policy or corporate policy of one reason or another. PowerShell 5.1 is there. It's, you know, it's very good in, in a lot of ways, so you have to support it. So we came up with a couple of basic, uh, basic differences. Um, if for ex uh, Invoke ResMed, for example, is wildly different in 5.1. So if I have a PowerShell 7 session and I run invoke rest method and I have the option allow insecure redirect, easy peasy, no problem. This, I've come across this problem a bunch of times that I have some new option, I think that solves the problem, great. If I jump over to Windows PowerShell and I run the exact same command, big fat no, okay? There's loads of differences. A more subtle one, if we have a JSON result, now everything that we do in our module is to do with REST APIs. So we deal with JSON all the time. There's a lot of subtle differences between how JSON is dealt with in 5.1 as, as opposed to PowerShell 7. It's a different uh, engine entirely. One of the things that comes out a lot though is regardless of the format, if your API returns an array and the array has one item, PowerShell, regardless, will enumerate that into an object. Right? You don't get an array with a single item, you get a single object. Now that's fine if you're checking the count in PowerShell 7, so here we have some uh, JSON data, we can you prefer it into an object. If result.count is equal to one, so there's only one of them, then I'm gonna do it. Otherwise, I'm gonna dive into the array index. If I run this, no problem, and we get Stuart at the bottom, because result.name. If I run this in 5.1, and this has come back to bite me a number of times, especially in my tests, run exactly the same code, I get nothing. Because result doesn't have dot .count. Single objects in PowerShell 5.1 don't have dot count. There's a really subtle difference and it's bitten me so many times. 
where I've been checking the count to say, okay, do I dive into the object or do I dive, do a for each or something like that? There are ways around it. You might be looking at it going, ah, well, you can do this. Yes, I can. You can work around it, but it's one of these subtle differences that will bite you. So when you're running your tests, run them in PowerShell 7 or whichever version you want as your lead version, also run them in PowerShell 5. You need to see that they work. Step number two, this is a little trickier. Sign your scripts. It's not easy. If you've got a small open source project and you want to cryptographically sign your scripts, that can be tricky because nobody offers free signing, code signing certificates anymore. Nobody. I went looking for one and I had to basically create my own internal CA in Windows Server to do it. It was a huge pain. If, however, you're publishing, uh, if you've got public users using this, and again, they're on servers or they're on lockdown laptops, we had this exact thing from a bank. They said, hey, we want to use your Akamai functions. These are really good. But our policy prevents running unsigned scripts, unsigned modules. So we had to go through this whole process. It's particularly uh, complicated in our organization to get stuff signed. But it means for every release, we have to get the code signed so that if you're on a box with an all signed uh, execution policy, that you can run this. Servers are commonly done this. If you go to your uh, security guys and say, I want to reduce the execution policy to say unrestricted uh, because I want to use the Akamai functions, they're not going to say yes. Nobody reduces security for that reason. They all look at it and say, no, you have to do it. So if you can sign your scripts, please, please do so. So just to show you how it looks, if I take my, jump into PowerShell 7 again. So I'm going to set my execution policy to all signed, which is the most brutal one. Um, and then I'm going to import a module I have put in, which is not signed, right? Big fat no. So this is, it'll flatly just not run your code whatsoever. So if, however, I want to sign it, it's pretty straightforward. If you have the certificate, you can use set authentic code signature. Let me just run this. So I'm going to sign this demo signed module. So if I have a look at this module, you should see that nothing is signed, right? A signature is basically just a block of uh, base64 data at the bottom. So there's nothing there. So if we go back to sign your scripts, and I run this. So it runs through them and it's check it basically comes back and says, okay, the status is valid. If we dive back into that demo sign, you suddenly got this signature block. It's quite straightforward to do. Just remember that once you've got a signature block, you cannot edit anything at all without invalidating the signature. Not comments, not line breaks, not white space. You might think, oh, well, those are impractical. Those don't have any bearing on the code. Doesn't matter. You say, change a single character, change a line break from LF to CRLF, it will invalidate the signature. So if you can sign them, please do sign them. So the next one, break down large modules. Now, as I mentioned, 1.12 of our module has 880 functions. I was particularly proud of that until I realized that to run any function, you have to import the whole module. 880 functions takes about 20 to 30 seconds to import. But you don't need 880 functions. In your average session, you probably need five, very few. So you see this uh, with the AZ module. It's broken down into hundreds of little bits. Now, I know we could compile. Our module could do it in C-sharp. There's other ways. But it was still unnecessary to have so many functions in one giant module. So we broke it out. We took sort of different API boundaries, and we broke it out into about, I think currently we count as 28 child modules. The largest has about 150 functions. The smallest has one. Um, and you may think, oh, that's easy peasy. When I import, so if I run a particular command, it's going to auto import the necessary function. Great. Nice and quick. So quick, in fact, that you shouldn't notice it happen. This is one of those ideal situations you want to be in, is when someone types one of your commands, they don't realize that the module is being loaded into memory in the background because the, the time to do it is so short. However, it does pose a bit of a problem for installation. If I have 28 modules, I don't want to have the user go and install them all. That's a huge pain in the neck. So we create a manifest module as a parent to them all which simply depends on all the others. So in a very basic example, if I have a demo grandparent here, go in my PSD1 file, it simply depends on demo parent. If I have demo parent, demo parent depends on demo child, and demo child doesn't depend on anything. So if I install a demo grandparent, I'm using a local repository. Um, basically just so that I don't have to use any network connections. This is just using a UNC share on my box. Should work, hopefully. So if I then run list available modules, it's gone off and it's installed them all automatically. 
So our manifest module at the top of our Akamai version two is just called Akamai. So you just say install module Akamai. It depends on 27 child modules and each of them in turn depend on a common module which has a bunch of shared functions in it. Similar, similar thing happens when you do import. So if I do get module demo, nothing's loaded. If I import it and then run get module again, ah, curses, ah, I forgot to undo my execution policy. I knew there'd be something. Uh, unrestricted, thank you. And we do get module, it automatically imports it. So the demo, the module structure, you could, if you wanted, just install the specific module, that, you know, the sub child module that you want. For me, that doesn't, that's not really a viable use case. I want to break it down in order to not load any functions that I don't need and keep it as efficient as possible. When you're playing around with different functions, different APIs, you don't even necessarily need to know which sub module covers your command, right? You'll see that if you do a get command or something like which sub module it's in, but if you say install module Akamai, you get all eight, 781 functions, I think it is at the moment. Um, and then you run function, 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 function. It might load two, three, four, five different child modules, but you don't need to be aware of that. So it makes things more efficient. It also means nothing gets too particularly large on, uh, uh, for you to manage. Okay, part of that, now we talked about um, auto loading. This was something that bit us for a while. Use explicit exports. Now PowerShell is very good at telling you this now. Didn't tell you this five years ago, which would have been helpful. If you have a module manifest and you say functions to export star, this used to be the default when you create a new module manifest. That seemed easy. And I see this a lot in the wild. I think, okay, great. It's just going to auto load all the modules. And then, so I would run it and no problem. I don't need to do import module. I type in a command and off it goes. When we added some functionality to run Akamai commands in a container, it didn't work. It kept saying command not found. What are you talking about? The reason is, that database of which module contains which functions, if you have functions export star, gets populated in the background by PowerShell when you're not looking. But it's not there the very first time. So if you run it in a container, which is a brand new environment, it's not done it yet. If, however, in your functions to export, you have the explicit names called out, I tried to reproduce this in my demo, but PowerShell was stubbornly working every time, which was really disappointing. Um, but if you have something like this, where if I have demo star export, so in my module here, I've got functions to export star. If I try and run these functions on a container or something where it doesn't already know about them, because I've done this two or three times in rehearsal, um, it's already populated in the background and I've not yet learned the way to purge it. It won't run the first time until you manually import the module, then PowerShell will go, okay, great, these are the functions and I'll keep an internal database of that. However, better would be to have this uh, explicit exports, so call out exactly which functions you have. This is a simple step. You put in your build scripts, it says here's all my functions, create an array of them, pass them into um, set module manifest, I think it is, update module manifest, I can't remember, and it will populate them all here. This will save you a world of pain, especially if you're hoping for people to use your code in containers which are absolutely vanilla, fresh, have never seen anything before. Step number five, this is a, this one should seem obvious, but it's not, it shouldn't be as obvious as you think, is use approved verbs. So if you have a delivery configuration in the Akamai platform, all of our UI, all of our documentation, all of our APIs, the verb they use to make that live is activate, okay? So you've got a property, you activate that property. When we were building this in the first place, I was looking at it kind of going, well, there's alternative verbs like deploy, or I could say new activation or something like that, but nothing really gelled with me. And I thought, well, what's the harm? I'll just put in activate dash property. It works fine, no problem. I don't necessarily agree that some of the other verbs are more discoverable. If you're using something obscure, fair enough, but there's a lot of synonyms of approved verbs that are just as linguistically valid, but aren't approved. And that list of approved verbs has not changed in a very long time, and it will not change. There's no hard and fast rule against it, but I think in the last 10 years, there's been something like two or three new verbs added. It's not a dynamic, ever-growing list. However, it throws an error, it throws a warning in the shell, and this freaked people out. This is what we learned, was anything in the shell that looks kind of bad will make people panic. This is basically what we discovered. So if I have 
uh, demo bad verbs in my module. So let's see, demo bad verbs. And it has a function called invoke thing, that's cool, and do thing, which is not cool. You can see the little squiggly line saying this is not cool. If I try and import it, something like this, we get this warning here. Some of the verbs are non-discoverable. It has no practical negative impact, this warning at all, right? It'll work, it'll work fine. But people get freaked out by this. People get very concerned. They see a warning and they immediately go, so having to explain, oh, you don't need to worry about this, oh, don't worry about this at all, was by far the bigger reason than just kind of good practice. Now, using approved verbs is good practice. But if you absolutely insist on using a verb which is not approved, then you can do it. Um, if I run these functions, invoke thing, do thing, blah, 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 it just basically calls out the name of the function. So let's remove that. And then let's do it the correct way, which is an alias in your function. Now, aliases are, are uh, kind of debatable in terms of good or bad, but if you absolutely insist, then you can simply add the bad verb as an alias to the function, and PowerShell will not care. This is absolutely valid. So if I import my module good verbs, right, no warning. If I run those same functions, there's no difference, okay? The function will be in there as an alias, but it will not care. So if you're swithering about, can I have this? Find the nearest appropriate verb and make that the name of your function, and then you can add in, if you absolutely must, the quote unquote bad verb um, as an alias to your function, and PowerShell will not grumble at all. Tip number six, ease of use. Now, ease of use is probably the main reason to build a PowerShell module in the first place. Right? We have our 93 APIs. Why not just use invoke REST method? You know, we've talked about the authentication. Let's say we, we used to have one PowerShell function published, which would handle the authentication. Why not just use that? Right? Here's the path, here's my credentials, blah, 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 off you go. The reason to make a module for me is to make it easier for your users. Stephen Booker talked about this yesterday. The shell should make things easier for you. Right? That's the whole point of a module. And because you're doing this, because you've got this abstraction layer between the user and the API, you can do tons of stuff, right? You can do whatever you want to make it easier for the user. So as I said in the introduction, APIs are for computers, right? APIs were not designed for humans to talk to. They have a bunch of unfriendly aspects. This is just always the case. For example, when you create an asset, you're gonna give it a friendly name. This is my config, whatever it is, right? But the API wants to know that ID. 1B, 2C, 4QF. You can't remember that. It's the whole reason we have phone books and DNS. So you can interrupt. Basically, you can have your function say, okay, give me the name. And if the user gives you the name, I'm gonna go off and find it. I'm gonna run another function in the background. Now, it makes it take a bit longer, slightly, and you can call this out in your help data to say, if you really want maximum efficiency, give me the ID. But for the most part, you can say, here's the name, I'll work out the bits. Same for a version. I never remember which version of my configs I have. So we implemented a system whereby, rather than just specifying the version number, this is version number 593, which I have to go and find, I can say, give me the version latest, automatically, right? And if it's latest, then we have another child function within the code which says, okay, go and get all the versions, find me the, sort them, descend and give me the first one. Easy peasy. Similarly, if you've got and an enum in your API, very, very common. Call it out in a validate set. Show the user exactly what they should be provided. Otherwise, the user's gonna to have to guess. Is it enabled? Um, is it enabled in all caps? Is the casing important, blah, blah, blah. If you give the user the options, then you can get through them in the shell. Also, what if the API fails? What if you need to do a retry? APIs fail all the time. You should never assume that any API works 100% of the time, because none do. This is something that you can cover for your user. User just gives you a command, goes off, makes a cup of coffee, comes back and gets the data, or waits two seconds in most cases. So if I import this function into the shell, if I'm using it, what's it, get thing? Uh, so I'm gonna say friendly name, my config. You'll notice because we're using a parameter set, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, it doesn't ask me for the unfriendly ID, that gets skipped automatically. Sweet, I'm gonna say version latest, and I'm gonna say status, and I can tab through the available options, right? This command here is way easier 
then invoke rest method path is you know, slash config slash 1b2 c equals to slash version slash 51, whatever it happens to be. This makes life a lot easier for your users. Try and do as many things in this area as you can. As I was saying, parameter sets. Parameter sets, bleh, I have a love-hate relationship with parameter sets. I love them when they do exactly what I want them to do and I hate them all the rest of the time. Because parameter sets are misused, or they're misused by me. Parameter sets are a way of saying these five things are option A for your command and these five things are option B. And if you do it like that, it works great. Okay, You've seen loads of the built-in commands do this. However, what we really use them for is for mutually exclusive pairs. If you have a name or an ID, okay, but you have to provide one of them, you can use a parameter set for that, and it works pretty well. So if I have a function like this, I've got six parameters, A, B, C, D, E, and F. The user should only provide one of A and B, C and D, E and F, okay? If I run the function like this, get stuff without parameter sets, Oops, there's something wrong there. Hang on a sec. That's because I'm, that's no problem. Oops, there we go. Get stuff without parameter sets. Pram A, say pram C, pram E. Okay, here's the values, no problem. But when I provide these, I can still be asked for more, okay? It'll say, say, here, what about those other parameters that we have? And there's nothing to stop the user, unless you call this out in your help data, we'll talk about it in a minute. There's nothing to stop the user just providing loads of input. So you could have something in the code which says, if param A and param C, or so param A and param B, throw an error, okay? I prefer not to do that when I can, because the user going through the whole process of crafting their command and then pressing execute and then you saying no, is less user-friendly, in my opinion, than you making it such that they're prevented from doing it incorrectly, where possible, okay? But what if we want to make param A and B mutually exclusive, C and D mutually exclusive, and E and F mutually exclusive? Well, it looks like this, and it's hideous. This is what I was talking about. A parameter can be a member of multiple parameter sets. So in this case, this could be parameter set A, C, and E, or A, C, and F, or A, D, like, you see what I mean? Every one of these, every pair you add adds an extra layer to this, and it becomes really nasty really quickly. Now, it works great, so if I run this function, hopefully this won't, ah, oh yeah, hang on, I keep doing this, I keep having a command in the shell and then going wrong. Okay, so if I say get stuff uh, with parameter sets, if I say param A, is A. Now I'm not asked for B anymore, okay? Sweet, so that's working. So, pram C, we're gonna go C, and again, I'm not asked for D, so I'm gonna go pram F. F, no problem. That looks like it's good. It works unless somebody looks at the code and sees the hideous horribleness that you've had to put in to make it work. But, there's a big trade-off for this in your help. So if I say get help, here we go. Ah, nuts. Why is that not finding? Ah, it's get stuff, what am I talking about? Get help, get stuff, yeah, there we go. So get help, by default, will show you a syntax for every parameter set that you have, okay? And it looks like this. If I'm a user looking at this, this is confusing to me, okay? These are all the different ways that you can call the function. There's eight of them. And all I wanted to say was, it's, it's just A or B, but not both. There's been various debates um, in the PowerShell team about how this can be done. I've read maybe four different threads, and they're one of those ones where you find a, a GitHub issue discussion from three years ago, and you scroll down to the bottom message, and it was from last week, and it's still going and going and going, and there's lots of people put forward suggestions, and they've been knocked down for various reasons. There is no way to do this I know of yet without using parameter sets, so you're trading off a couple of things. So if you can make it done so that the user doesn't have to do this, Great. If you have to do it some other way such that something like the syntax doesn't look horrible, then you probably have to put in some error handling within your code to say, if we've got two mutually exclusive parameters, we're going to freak out. How are we doing for time? We're doing okay, sweet. 
Positionality. Now, positionality is an, is an interesting one because under normal circumstances, you don't need to care. Okay, so positionality, in case you guys don't know what I'm talking about, it means that you can provide parameters without the parameter name. Very super simple concept, but just in case the, the word is unknown to you. Um, if I have a basic function, invoke simple. Let's have a look. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Actually, we don't even need to help you. I'll show you that in a minute. So if I run the function, invoke simple. Ah, curses, I keep doing this. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, no problem. If I'd say invoke simple three, two, one, shows me a parameter A is three, parameter B is two, parameter C is one. So everything is done in order. I don't need to specify the names. Life is good. That's fine. Now, I prefer when I'm teaching PowerShell, I like long, verbose commands that show you exactly what you're doing. I don't like, in general, CLIs where you're guessing what this parameter is. You know, like, if, if you haven't given it a name, and you get this quite a lot in command line tools, it's very common on Unix tools, you just say X, Y, Z, and you're kind of guessing what X, Y, and Z actually are. I prefer to say to people, have a very long command and it says parameter A is X, parameter B, blah, blah, blah. But I still use built-in PowerShell commands every day of my life without specifying parameter names. I'm a total hypocrite in this way. When was the last time anyone added dash path when using get child item? You don't, you just say, shame on you. <laughs> You just say get child item, my folder, and it does it, right? You don't think about it. But under normal circumstances, when you write a function, you don't have to worry about it. However, what I discovered when I was doing this, even if you have a complex function, sorry, it's exactly the same, um, and I'll show you how this looks in the uh, help. So if I say get help invoke simple, but I want to do a parameter A, uh, ah, mm -hmm, live typing. Okay, so parameter A is quite happy, but it says position zero. If I say parameter B, it says position one and so forth. Everyone believes me. If I have my invoke more complex function, so it's got commandlet binding, it's got parameter definitions, it's an advanced function in the Microsoft parlance. If I run the same thing, invoke more complex, parameter A, it's the same. Okay, no problem. Position A, uh, position zero, position one and so forth. However, if you add a parameter set anywhere in the function, it disables positional parameters across the whole function. This has bitten me a lot. It's particularly problematic. So any parameter set anywhere, not just within the parameters, is gonna bite you. So if you want to support positional parameters when you're doing this, you have to specify manually. So it looks a bit like this. I've actually prepped this. Um, the one thing to, so you can say position zero, position start at zero, like array indices. Um, so I'm gonna call out A1 is gonna be position zero, B and C. A2 doesn't have a position, and this is one of the trade-offs of parameter sets. If you're not specifying the parameter name, then PowerShell doesn't know which one you're talking about. If you provide, you know, so if I run invoke with position, blah, 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 like this, and say invoke with position, one, two, three, then it's inferring from position that you're talking about A1. But you can't say uh, A2 is gonna also be position zero because there's no way to know which one's which. If you set a default parameter set, then it not, it does, it not knowing which position is which, it's just gonna say, okay, you must be A1. If the default parameter set here is one, I'm gonna guess that that's what you're talking about. So if you've got mutually exclusive pairs, you're kind of sacrificing that unless you have some other way of, of specifying the, um, the parameter set. Now, one thing to call out in the help, it also subtly changes help output. So if I say get help invoke simple, um, if I look at the syntax, you'll notice the square brackets. Okay, square brackets around the parameter name. If I run the same thing, get help invoke, ah, if I could type, with position, Ah, sorry, that's actually fixed then. So invoke with parameter sets was the one I wanted. Get help, invoke with parameter sets. Is that? Ah, oh, curses, why is this? Ah, because I didn't import it to my session. Of course not. Foolish mortal. Live demos, people. Okay. Here we go. 
the help output looks slightly different. There's no square brackets around the parameter name. So this is telling you that it's, 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 only, it's only allowed to be a named parameter. And if you say get help in the parameter, it will say position named every one. So if you're using, if you want positionality and you're using parameter set names, you have to make it explicit. Number nine, how am I doing? 10 more minutes. Okay, I'm gonna talk faster. Uh, number nine, embrace the pipeline, beware the pipeline. So pipeline support is one of the best things about PowerShell commandlets you can have. Flat out is brilliant, I love it. However, it requires a little bit of care and attention to do. So we have a situation that we've really worked towards where we want to be able to get a thing, to the get command, edit it locally, and then pipe it to almost exactly the same command and have that updated. So it's an HTTP get, then you do something and it's HTTP put. This command here and this command here, lines three and five, are exactly the same, except for an equals and a pipe and a G and an S. I love this, it makes life so much easier. However, your APIs may not support this natively. Your API for a put request might have a totally different request body than for a get request. But you can do stuff within your functions to kind of fix it. And that's just something that I really promote is make it super easy for the user to get a thing and then pipe it back to set or change the name and pipe it to new or something like that. If you can make that happen, it makes life so much easier. But you have to be kind of careful because you're intercepting what the user is doing. So I have a function like this, name, version, status, and my config. Remember value from pipeline, you have to have that in order to use the pipeline. Remember the process block, you have to have a process block to use the pipeline. I've made that mistake many times. If you don't, it won't complain. It'll just work weirdly if you pipe an array. If you, have a pro if you don't have a process block and you pipe an array, it will do the thing on the last entry, but not any of the other ones. So I had this problem where I was updating host names and sending them an array, and suddenly I would end up with one host name in my config and I, I couldn't understand it and it was because I was missing process blocks. So in this case, what we're doing is we're reconstructing a different request body. We're adding this operation replace and then the config is gonna be my object and then I'm, gonna, then I'm gonna send it off with a post request or a put or whatever it is you're doing. No problem. Something to, uh, something to kind of consider. You might have to sort of change response bodies, change request bodies to sort of intercept it. Now, Pop quiz for anyone just to see if you're paying attention. What would happen in this function, which I do have the process block I was talking about, what would happen if I piped an array to this function? So the answer from the audience was correct, which basically means it will invoke a rest method once per item in the array. Okay, fine, great, sweet. What if you don't want it to do that? What if you wanted to send the whole array? I deal with a bunch of rest APIs which expect an array or the object that I'm piping in is simply an array and I don't want it to do it multiple times. This has come back to bite us a couple of times too. In this case, the solution is a little long-winded. You have to do something like this. You have to have your begin, process, and end blocks. You have to create an array in begin. Apologies, I'm using the horrible array. There was, I was just at a talk earlier that said, don't, you, don't do this. This is a shorthand for an example. I'm using a, a proper generic list under normal circumstances. Every time through the process block, input array is actually the item in the array. That gets a little confusing in terms of the param is one item rather than an array when referenced in the process block. And then we actually do what we want to do in the end block. This has bitten me a couple of times. Watch out for this. If, you're, if your command or function or endpoint wherever expects an array of items and you're just piping that direct in, if it's a child object of a PS custom object, you don't need to care. But if you're piping an array directly, and you want all of them to go in a single command, depends on the API, then this is something to watch out for. Tip 10, I've got six minutes, I'm gonna talk fast. Tip 10 is, the best way to help your users is documentation. Now, I made this mistake for many years. I thought, code is better. I wanna give users functionality. Functionality is way better than help. No, it's not. Flat out, big fat lie. This, I was just kidding myself because I didn't want to sit down and write help docs. And having now done it, I can understand why I didn't want to sit down and write help docs, because it took months. When you have 800 functions that you need to write help docs for, me and the rest of the team spent ages doing it. But it's so much better to explain how your thing works. You want your users to be able to use your code. If you just give them code, they're guessing how it works, okay? Also, if you add a cool new feature, nobody's gonna use it. Nobody's gonna appreciate your own genius when they don't know how to use your stuff. It's in your interests to write the help docs and to show off how wonderfully clever you happen to be. 
So if I have a function like this, invoke unhelpful questions three, um, extra points for anyone who spots the obvious movie reference. So I say get help, invoke, ah, I hate laptop keyboards. That's not a lot of information. That's kind of thin and a bit rubbish, okay? Even if I do full, in fact, in full it looks even starker. Does this help you? Not hugely. It tells me what data types they are, what my parameters are, what the syntax probably is, but it's not a whole heap of use, okay? Adding help, now there's many different ways to do this. The example I have is the simplest, but we don't use this. We use PlatyPS, which you guys should totally check out because it's awesome. Here's a much more useful function. The code here is identical. It doesn't do anything different at all, but it has a whole bunch of stuff. It's a synopsis to tell people how it works, a description, a link to see where to get the code, an example. Examples are tremendously helpful. How do I actually do this? And then each parameter has a description. So if I then use this, pop that into my help, do, do, do. get help, invoke helpful, questions three. Actually, let me do a full, just so you can see it all in its mighty glory. You've got loads of information, okay? Here's my synopsis and description. For each one, it tells you what to put in. This is this data is all here in the shell. It's the best way to help your users. Question. Awesome. So the comment from the audience was in VS Code, if you do two hashes, then it will auto-populate the boilerplate for this, which is tremendously helpful. And we recently started doing it in PlatyPS. We were reading help docs primarily from our API spec, so we had to write a bit of a boilerplate around it. And then we were basically populating function help with PlatyPS, which generates a whole bunch of markdown, and then that gets squished into a giant XML, which gets shipped with the module. So if you're doing it at scale, you might not be doing comment-based help, but what you get out is exactly the same. The point is the user's like, how do I use this function? I found the function, get property, that sounds about right. What does it do? This is where you can get most value. If, if you take one thing away from this talk, take the most boring thing, which is write the help talks. Right, three minutes and I'm running out of time. Uh, Test all the things. I don't have any code for this. And I don't just mean pester. Pester is wonderful. If you're not using pester, shame on your bad self. Right? You should have pester test for everything you can think of, but more. Test things that are not necessarily functional. Our, the way our module works is if a file name is not the same as the function name, it doesn't import properly. Right? You should have a script which tests that. Right? If you have unused variables, for instance, we have uh, query string parameters we pass to a child function. There was a couple of, uh, couple of instances where I populated the query string parameters, but I hadn't actually sent them as a parameter. Nice yellow squiggly line in VS Code, but I hadn't noticed it, right? That's a mistake. Test for that kind of stuff. That might, Pester can do tons and tons of things, but there might be a couple of things that you cannot do, but you have to test absolutely everything. Check it on every operating system. Check it on every version of PowerShell you can think of and automate all of that. I was just in an excellent talk uh, where you can do this all in, in, in GitHub Actions, right? Every commit, every pull request, everything should automatically spring all of your tests. Far more stuff than you might think. Testing was tremendously useful, but it took ages. I spend much more time writing tests than I do writing code, which seems weird, but when you're basically writing a module for an API, in order to write a test, you need to understand what it does. Writing the function is easy. That takes no time at all. Or you can automate it, which I'm going to tell you in a minute. Um, but understanding the thing in order to do proper tests can take longer. But it's so worth it. So many times I have added in a cool new feature, which worked. But then I ran my test, and it broke a bunch of other core functionality, which I didn't want to break. Your new feature working is not worth breaking the old stuff. Okay. Test absolutely everything before you release anything at all, but don't do it manually, because doing stuff manually is for mugs. Final one, auto-generate your code and tests. I watched the talk last year. I realized the YouTube link here is not hugely helpful, but I'll publish this all to GitHub. There's a talk from last year's summit by Daniele Tacania and Zhen Hao Yi about auto-generating your GitHub modules from Swagger definitions. It was awesome, and I stole their idea. So it uses EPS templates. If you've never seen the EPS module, EPS templates are very similar in function to something like Ruby templates. If you've ever done Puppet, you've probably seen this before. I've done a lot of Puppet and it 
former life. And what you get here basically is what you've got is a string template. So this is generating a function, but then anything within these tags is either getting the value of a variable or it's executing code. Something as simple as this, th their example was all C-sharp stuff, it was very complicated. I took it and I took just the one bit I wanted. If I take something like this, this template, set that as a string, and then I take some binding, so this is just the data I'm gonna put in, and then I invoke the EPS template. What you should get out of it looks kinda like a real function. It's looping through different parameters, it's got an, a, a conditional, it's super easy to do. If you have some kind of source of truth for APIs, like a Swagger or a RAML or whatever else, don't go off and do all the manual work. Don't create files and copy and paste them and tweak and all the rest of it. You might need to do bits of that afterwards anyway for all the cool new features that I've been talking about. But getting that boilerplate, that 80% of the code in place first, that should be all automatic. You shouldn't waste your time with that. If you've got some kind of source to generate your code, EPS templates are tremendously useful. So let's jump back to the slides. Okay, so we went through all these different things. Blah, 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 blah. You can see all the different fun pictures I decided to use. Uh, one thing I want to point out before I finish, just because I'm childish. Can anyone name the film? It's from Back to the Future 2. That's Elijah Wood when he's about eight. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> it's very weird. Uh, so yeah, that's all the ideas I have for you. If you can, if you want to come up and talk to me later, I can dive into way more detail. I realize I did a bit of a whirlwind and talked way too little about way too much. But if you want to get more detail in this, please do. If you want to check out our module and you have suggestions, I'm here to learn as much as anything else. I would love to hear comments and whatever, as long as they're constructive um, about stuff that we've done. We'll be releasing hopefully this week. Um, if you're a customer of Akamai's, please check it out. Oh, thanks to Akamai, by the way, for funding my trip here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. It's really generous. Any final questions from the audience? Go on once. In which case, thank you very much. Please do the survey. It's really important. And yeah, have a good rest of your summit. Thanks, guys.